Hi, and welcome to the latest episode of Wall Street Wildlife, or is it Telescope Investing? <laughs> I am joined on the pod this week by my best friend and old podcast buddy, Albert. Albert, welcome back. Hey, Luke. Thanks for having me. You're uh, very kindly standing in because Christoph is off swanning around the world for once, having adventures. So we thought we'd do an old telescope look-in. And it's been ooh, over two years since we podcasted together. So uh, today's episode is a bit of a retrospective. I've been jabbering on the Twitters constantly about what I'm doing in my portfolio. But if anyone's still hanging around from our old telescope listenership, today Albert is going to share, well, a life update, but also uh, some changes he's made in his portfolio and how he's thinking about investing these days. Yeah, I've been pretty quiet on Twitter since we stopped Telescope. Ever since we stopped doing that, you know, the stock market has been less of a focus for me. But I still read a lot and I keep track of my portfolio. And, you know, I have made a few moves that we could talk about. So I call myself a professional investor, but you also essentially live your life on your investment income. How do you think about yourself? Are you an investor first? Um, I think so. I spend quite a lot of time on my portfolio, on my investments. I wouldn't say it's a job in the same way that you do investing. You have a lot of things like seven investing and also your own brand on Twitter or slash X. And you, you do quite a lot on that front. Uh, but I don't really do that. I wouldn't call myself a professional investor. We are both quite lucky. Like you uh, harried me across the line. You retired first a couple of years before I did. And that really lit a fire under my backside and made me think, I need to get out from under the uh, the yoke of HSBC. So how are you enjoying the journey so far? It must be coming up for, what, seven or eight years of retirement for you now? Uh, it hasn't been that long, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's fun. Uh, I like being retired. and I'm never bored. Um, and it's definitely more fun than going to work every day. And I have to say that you work pretty hard for someone who's retired. Uh, you do a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, well, look, hey, I love a little project and I work hard at everything. Uh, it's in the character. So um, and I get that from my dad. He never quite retired. He's, uh, he retired for about two weeks, decided he was going <laughs> to die in his armchair and then came out and took on one of the biggest projects of his life. So uh, maybe it's in the Hallard DNA. Yeah, maybe. You know, sometimes I forget how lucky we are that we are able to retire in our early early 50s. Um, and I think we owe most of that to our stock investments. Like we've been investing for almost 30 years and it takes that long to build uh, a nest egg. And, you know, all these people trying to get rich quickly, they're just taking too many risks. Well, we built our kind of nest eggs very slowly. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's about learning the lessons slowly. Like you can make a ton of mistakes when you're younger and then you're less likely to blow yourself up when it's much more important, when the numbers are much bigger later in life. Yeah, actually one thing I've tried to do in the past two years is encourage some of my younger relatives to start investing. Like some of them have just finished college and have just started their careers, which I think is a really good time to start investing. But I didn't really want to be too pushy about it and, you know, how, how annoying it is when someone is like telling you to do something all the time. So what I did was send two of them a book, Just Keep Buying by Nick Maguli, um, which I read twice, actually. And I thought it was a great introduction to investing and personal finance in general. And I sent this, I sent this to them um, a few months ago and they both said they would read it, but I haven't heard anything back from them since, since then. Uh, so I hope they've read it and have started investing. I had some friends coming over for the weekend. Uh, they, they just left yesterday. And I'm trying to persuade them to get started investing for their daughter, Freya. She's about five. Like, that's a great time to get started. Um, I've been harrying them over this for a couple of years. They haven't got started yet. Um, but I'll continue to the pester them across the line. Because if you can start investing at that super young age, like for, for not a huge amount of money with 15 years of compounding on your side, if, if nothing else... Right, that's probably the education paid for and taken care of. Yeah, I wish I started investing at five instead of 20. <laughs> I'd like to share some news, some personal news. Since we stopped uh, telescope investing, uh, one thing that happened is that I got married. Yeah. I was aware. I was there. It was, uh, yeah. it was an incredible occasion. So let me publicly thank you for being my best man. You did an <laughs> awesome job. I still get comments about it today, actually. <laughs> 
actually, yeah, actually but... I want to let your listeners know that not only are you a good investor, but you're also a good dancer. <laughs> <laughs> I well, still can't so, believe that you and four of the friends spent months practicing uh, a dance routine. Uh, you did a five-minute dance routine to "As Long as You Love Me" by the Backstreet Boys, and yeah. you, friends still give me comments about it to this day. <laughs> you were a very good sport as a groom. You uh, you put up with three bachelor parties, which were all incredible fun. You wore. <laughs> I don't know, it must have been 10 different costumes over the course of the month I was out in Hong Kong and Asia with you. And uh, yeah, and you were a good sport when it came to the uh, the best man speech and the dance off. Well, thank you again. Uh, you're a very lucky man. You've uh, married uh, the perfect girl for you. And uh, I wish you all the, the uh, health and happiness and longevity. And I'm looking forward to getting back to a regular old age podcast cadence with you when we're living potentially next door to each other somewhere in the world. You just need to tell Maybe. me where you want to move to and I'll go set up <laughs> 10 years ahead I'll, of you. I'll give you some advance notice. Very good. Um, well, we've got, to, we've got to fund that uh, that homestead life. And so what we're doing in our portfolios today is critical to uh, making sure we can afford to live in the luxury that we uh, we want to when when we're in our 60s. So... What are you doing in your portfolio these days? Let's do a bit of a retrospective. And if we remind ourselves, um, back in January 2022, that's the last time we recorded the Telescope Investing podcast, I've been sharing my own portfolio changes all along the way. But I took a a quick look back at the changes I'd made since Telescope Investing about two and a half years ago. I've sold a lot of what I now consider to be junk. Obviously, I didn't consider it to be junk at the time. Um, but a whole bunch of companies that I've shedded along the way, companies like Curiosity Stream, Fiverr, Magnite, Twilio. I've also rebalanced my portfolio quite a lot. I used to have pretty big exposure to Shopify, 16%. That's down to nearly 2.5% these days. Um, I've also increased some companies like Mercado Libre. I now consider that a core investment. And maybe the biggest thing is I think the strategy is working Like I've managed to pay myself essentially about a year and a half worth of expenses. Like I've covered my costs and my portfolio is still up anyway compared to that date. So that's kind of, I suppose it's how it's supposed to work, right? Pay yourself, but you keep growing and you can pay yourself increasing amounts as the time rolls on. So I think retirement's working out for me. But what have you done in your portfolio since the telescope days? Oh, well, before we get there, let me ask you a question first. Like, you know, you had you said you uh, reduced Shopify from 16% to 2.6%. Um, well, at 16%, it's probably ripe for trimming anyway, but you reduced it quite quite a lot, like from 16 to 2.6 is quite a drop. Why did you do that? Yeah, deliberate decision, actually. Um, I felt that Toby Lutke, or the company, had made just one too many unforced errors for my liking. Back in 2022, uh, they really looked like they had a differentiated proposition and supporting retail being like the operating system for commerce, as they call themselves, but with logistics and delivery and all this stuff packaged together. It seemed like a really compelling product for customers. And then they went on a buying spree where they bought Deliver and they tried to in-house logistics, then they realized that was actually going to be too hard to compete with Amazon. As one of my notable colleagues, Matt Cochran, pointed out very very clearly back in those days. And uh, the company came to the same realization. And so really only, I think, six months or a year later, they sold their logistics on to Flexport and um, exited logistics. So like that made sense, I suppose, but two things stuck in my head that made me reduce. One, they were no longer a, a fully differentiated proposition. Essentially now, they were like a payments platform and e-commerce tools, but there are other platforms out there that do the same sort of thing. You know, maybe they're the best, but, um, but if, when they didn't have the in-house logistics, potentially they're just another WooCommerce or Wix. And then just the unforced error nature of it, investing in logistics and then six months later changing their mind. I'm a fan of companies that can change their minds, but it cost them a couple of billion dollars. And perhaps more importantly, it set them back like over a year on their roadmap. And so 
I probably always owned Shopify. Like it's the one stock that got me into retirement pretty much with the gains I made over 2016 through 2022. But it didn't feel like it deserved an overweight allocation in my portfolio. Oh, that's interesting because Shopify is still my fourth or fifth largest invent, uh, holding. Uh, I think it counts for about 5% of my portfolio. So the fact that you reduce it so much, it gives me a pause for thought. It's always good to chat about this stuff with friends. And you and I chat on WhatsApp all the time about our investments. So what's your immediate reflection on what I just said about Shopify? Like, Do you feel you're appropriately allocated? I see what you're saying. And I was aware of those, uh, those changes to the Shopify business model. Um, but I still see that there's a lot of growth left for the company. Like, I think the market, market capitalization for Shopify is around 90 billion. Is that correct? Sounds um, about right. Yeah. They're much, much smaller than the likes of Amazon and all those uh, big e- e-commerce players. Uh, but you're right. You know, maybe their, their product is being commoditized. There's a lot of different uh, products out there that do more or less the same thing, you know, just one off the top of my head is Wix. They do, you, know, you can build a website, have a, a shopping basket and check out facilities. So, you know, as you said, they may be the best, but maybe there's just competition is just too easy. But I wouldn't argue with a 5% allocation. I still think it's an incredible company and they, they almost certainly do have the best proposition out there. It's just whether it deserves such a large allocation in your portfolio. That's probably an individual decision. Fair enough. For the last two years, I guess, as, as I mentioned before, the stock market has been much less of a focus uh, because I'm not, do, I'm not doing a weekly podcast about it. Uh, so I actually traded much less than I did during the telescope investing years, which is, I think is actually a good thing. My trading costs ballooned during those years because we were talking about stocks all the time. I just felt the urge to trade and it probably did my portfolio more harm than good. But I did make a few moves in the last two years. And one of them was sell uh, Teladoc. Uh, you might have be familiar with this because I think you saw it as well. And yeah, I, I did manage to avoid most of the COVID stocks that went on, went on to rise really quickly during COVID and then crashed as soon as COVID ended. Uh, stocks like Zoom and Peloton. But, you know, I did get caught by some and this one was one of them, Teladoc Health. Yeah, you're right. I, I also shedded that one from my portfolio. I think you and I fell in love with that a little bit and I had quite a big allocation to it um, and lost an absolute ton of cash. Um, when did you get out with your skin intact or have you also <laughs> spent like a year's worth of expenses on Teladoc? Well, it, it depends on your point of view. Um, well, I guess at the time, telemedicine made a lot of sense, but now I don't really think it's a growth area. I think it's a very niche area. I think most people would want to see their doctors in a face-to-face setting. Um, so I sold this about two years ago at a loss of around 80%. And that sounds a lot, but I'm glad I sold it at that time because I think the stock has dropped another 60% since then, which would have made it a 94% loss for me. Yeah, yeah, Which is yeah, more yeah, than totally. 100%. Like if you sold exactly two years ago, it was trading at about $65. And today it's trading at just under $13. It's a really good instructive lesson, I think, that what goes down can still go lower. Like you could be sitting on a, what 90% drawdown in us in a company and if the stock can still halve again uh, and you've lost from that point you've lost half of your money again if you're looking at in the big scheme you go oh well, so I, I lost 90% and now I've lost like 95% but that journey from 90% loss to 95% loss you've halved your money if you had like $10,000 that's now worth $5,000 so that's real a real loss so yeah, you shouldn't be ever looking at your portfolio and going, oh, it's fallen so far. It can't keep going down. Like stuff can keep going to zero and get delisted. And that does happen. Yeah, right, Luke. And one thing you always tell me is to stop anchoring. Forget yeah. about the price you pay for the stock. Just think about what the stock can do from this point onwards. If you don't believe in a stock from now, it doesn't matter how much you lost on it. You have to act in a way that, that you think is right. Yeah, good. Well, let's go through some of your other uh, major changes and let's see if we can identify anything that you're <laughs> anchoring on still. Well, another stock that you also held was Fiverr. And I held this, but I also sold this uh, at an 80% loss. And this, <laughs> this one hurts, actually, because uh, you know at the time, I thought their business model made a lot of sense. Like freelancing was becoming more and more important. 
uh, yeah, sure, the COVID uh, pandemic accelerated it, but I th- I thought really that afterwards it would continue to continue to grow. But what I didn't see was the arrival of generative AI, and that really disrupted uh, the business model for Fiverr. I probably saw this way too late, you know, way after GPT came out. Uh, you were telling me to uh, to really look at this, and I kind of ignored, not ignored you, but I kind of like held on hoping that Fiverr would have an answer. And in the end, it's actually one of your tweets, Luke, that pushed me over the edge to press that sell button. I don't know if you remember, but you tweeted a response to a tweet from Fiverr where they were touting a company uh, that was hiring voice actors on the Fiverr platform to train an AI that would replace voice actors. And yeah. you said this was really stupid and short-sighted. <laughs> and I have to agree with you. And what that tweet told me was that Fiverr didn't really have an answer to generative AI. All they could do was lean into it and and then lose um, the people working using their platform. Yeah, I, f- I forgot about that. You're right. Uh, I tweeted their investor relations department because they had it as like a whole full page example, like a use case in their investor relations deck. And it's just insanity. Like they're cannibalizing, Fiverr are cannibalizing their own business model. And so, you know, to do that, okay, fine, it's work, you get paid for it. And it's going to happen whether you support it or not. But to make like a press release essentially out of it in your investor relations deck, that just shows a level of, um, I don't know if it's incompetence or just not thinking about the big picture. Um, yeah, so I was I was happy to get away. Well, as I said, I got out of it with a loss of 80%. And right. um, it would have been like 50% if I sold when you told me to. So that kind of helps. <laughs> You know what? Actually, AI has been one of the main themes of the stock market since we stopped Telescope. AI is everywhere now. Um, but we have to think that it only became mainstream about two years ago. And we're really in the early stages of AI. So you, know, you have yeah. to remember that. Well, you got me onto the whole theme of AI. You know, you and I were talking about mega trends way, way back. Five, ten years ago, we've used that as the mainstay of our own investing themes and you know, essentially try and find the uh, the forces, I, the language I use these days frequently is find the companies that are selling products or services the world needs more of in 10 years' time. And you identified AI far way back than I did. And you put me on to NVIDIA um, as an investment. You were in NVIDIA many years before I was, but now it's becoming like a mainstay in my own portfolio. How have you played your own NVIDIA investment? Uh, it wasn't many years, probably just like a actually. About, about a year before you did. I mentioned all these stocks I had to sell at a loss and I had several other small bets that I made on companies like um, Curiosity Stream and Matterport, which I also sold at a loss. But you know what? All these losses were covered by the gains by one stock and you, you know, it, was in, it was NVIDIA. You know, I, bought, I first bought this in November 2021, which is pretty late in the NVIDIA story. You know, if you had bought this like 10 years ago, you'd be much, much richer. But I bought it in 2021, which in hindsight was actually a really bad time to buy because I could have got it for half the price, either six months earlier or six months later. So it felt like a peak. And I kind of I was kind of kicking myself after I bought it, like six months after I bought it. But you fast forward to today, and the stock is three times my initial investment. So you know, if you pick the right company, you, know, you can really make a big difference to your portfolio. Yeah, I guess your encouragement's got me into the stock possibly got that that dip six months after you. Um, I've had to trim it a little bit. It's one I've kept an eye on for valuation reasons. It's kind of a new part of my process. I think you and I, particularly through the 2020 insanity, we maybe we got into perhaps a bad habit of just ignoring valuation and buying stories. And I, I think I've revised my own process in the last couple of years, probably the biggest change to how I invest these days. I've I treat the finance financials as far more important than I used to. And so NVIDIA and maybe CrowdStrike are two companies that I believe in their long-term future. But when I perceive that they're overvalued, I'm trimming. And actually, that's hurt me with NVIDIA. Like, I should, I should have just bought it and never touched it. I've, it's doubled or tripled from the point where I started trimming. But you've got to manage risk at the same time as um, letting your winners run. Absolutely. And I think NVIDIA is now worth $2.2 trillion, has a market cap of $2.2 trillion. So, you know, you might find it hard to believe how much 
further this can go. But I think I read somewhere or heard someone said their price target for NVIDIA by 2030 is $10 trillion, uh, which sounds unbelievable, but yeah, who knows? I think I'm I'm sticking to my guns. I think the world's first ten trillion dollar company will be SpaceX. Well, maybe I've I've got a few things to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, let's go there anyway. Like I was going to mention this later, but um, I think as as I said, one of the things we did back in 2019, I think, was to come up with these mega trends. And you mentioned AI, but another one was the space economy. And you know, I kind of laughed it off. I laughed it off at the time because you mentioned things like asteroid mining, which sound ridiculous. But you know, t- today the space economy is well and truly alive with companies like SpaceX. And I believe Boeing was trying to launch something a few days ago and failed, uh, unsurprisingly. Uh, and but another company is Rocket Lab, and this is a company that I heard through you and your colleagues at Seven Investing. And you know, I, I read about it and I said. You know, this is a really small company, but they're doing great stuff. You know, they're way behind uh, SpaceX, but they could catch up eventually. Uh, so I made a small investment. And I, I realized that this is a high-risk investment. It could go down to zero, but you can still take a few risks. You know, it's a very small part of my portfolio. It's just under 1% of the portfolio. So even if, if it fails, you know, it's not going to be a, a big impact. But if it succeeds, it could 10x or more. Yeah, absolutely, hundred um, percent. And they just had results yesterday. We're recording on Tuesday, the seventh of May. They reported last night on the sixth. Results look solid. I haven't oh, really drilled okay. them in great detail, but they look pretty robust. I think I'm, I'm also. I've got a one percent position in Rocket Lab. I consider this a high conviction stock for my own portfolio, but I've kept that one like a smaller allocation deliberately, just because with tiny companies like this, like two billion dollar company, it's probably going to be very volatile. And they're also, they're, they're trying to transition to their Neutron platform, which is essentially sort of to put bigger payloads into orbit. Um, it's just going to cost them a ton of cash to get Neutron operational. And yet last night's results, I did notice a headline. They've pushed back the Neutron um, timeline by nine months to a year. So oh, okay. I'm not surprised by that at all. Um, actually, I'm kind of pleased that they're not rushing into it because they're more likely to have failures and costs if they do rush. And yeah. they're making good money. Like if they go back, if they push everything back a year, they'll have more money in the bank to be able to um, sustain what's probably going to be quite an expensive period as they have inevitable launch failures and try and get neutral and operational. So um, I'm encouraged by yesterday's results. I'm probably going to add a little bit maybe in the next day or two. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think... I suspect the market didn't like the fact they did that they delayed Neutron, but to me that's good news. Yeah, you know, that means they're they're careful, they're they're sensible, and long term it should serve them better. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. That was my instinctive reaction. I'm glad to hear you say the same thing. You know, um, I've been trying to buy SpaceX for a while, for a couple of years. We, we had a tantalizing offer from a podcast guest we had back in 2021, I think. But it didn't ever come to fruition, and he, he, he offered to let me in on the round he was leading. Oh, really? um, yeah. So I and, and so uh, if you don't know, so SpaceX is uh, probably if, if not the biggest, maybe the second biggest private company in the world. Current private market valuation is somewhere around one hundred and eighty to two hundred billion dollars, um, and that's that somewhere around is kind of key because the difference between private and public market investments is. Um, there isn't like a public exchange where you can go and buy and sell stock. If you want to buy stock in SpaceX, either you have to buy it directly from the company when they have an issue, which means you know your deal size is has to be in the hundreds of millions, if not the billions of dollars. Otherwise, they won't even. They're not going to waste their time talking to you. So most people buy it through something called an SPV, special purpose vehicle. So I found a platform, oh, and and an SPV is essentially like a a company that just gets wrapped around that single investment. So essentially, smaller investors could have a piece of the SPV and the SPV buys the stock. So it's kind of putting like a corporate wrapper allows, you know, if you're only talking about a few million dollars, um, it allows you still to get a piece of the private market action. So I've been looking at a platform called Hive at various listings for SpaceX. Essentially, it's like a a secondary market for these sort of things and people buy and sell 
their holdings in these SPVs. Um, like the prices are all over the place, uh, ranging between maybe 160, 170 billion dollars and like 300 billion dollars on this platform. And essentially, when you buy a different listing, you're getting different terms. If I say run an SPV or I have a chunk, I might sell a few million dollars of my holding, but I'm still keeping some of the back end. Like I'll charge, if I'm selling it to you, I'll charge you maybe five or 10% upfront, maybe 20% upfront. And then when it exits, if it ever exits, I might have some percentage on the back end. I might even have an annual management fee. Wow. So yeah, so it's, it's really, some of the terms are really ugly and I just haven't found one that makes sense. Um, but I would love to own a piece, but I think I'm just too small ball with my, you know, little six figure investments. Wow. Yeah. The private market, is, it doesn't sound like a place for the faint heart, faint of heart. I think I would wait until it became publicly listed before investing. Yeah. I don't really like this, uh, private market. So you said that, uh, SpaceX has a private valuation of almost $200 billion. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That strikes me as quite high actually. Um, when I think about it. Even though they are the leader, I have to believe that you know launching rockets is a niche business. It's not going to be you know happening every single day. It's not going to have it's not going to have high volume. So I kind of have doubts whether this is really worth um, two hundred billion dollars. Well, you clearly don't suffer from a terrible internet and realize that it's not possible to get fiber to run to your house. Because I'm looking at getting Starlink installed right here in Kent at the moment, because I can't get anything better than about 50 megabits on my uh, broadband connection. If I stick a Starlink dish on the side of the house, I can get closer to a gigabit. They're not a one-trick pony. They got launch, but they've also got satellite internet, and they've probably got a ton of other potential businesses. Like as the only, apart from Rocket Lab, as the two only companies, private industry companies, putting stuff into orbit. Like they've got a lock on this market right now. And uh, this is, I don't know if I'm quoting James T. Kirk, but you know, this, this is like the final frontier stuff. It's inevitable that if we don't blow ourselves up, we're going to end up in space. So it seems inevitable to me that companies like SpaceX and Rocket Lab are well positioned to benefit from that as essentially like they're the train lines of the uh, pioneer days in the US. I don't plan to die with a, a, a fortune. I want to spend it by the time I, I leave this earth. So I have to think about my investments within my own lifespan. Um, so even if SpaceX and you know Rocket Lab go on to become these multi-trillion dollar companies say in 50, 60 years time, it won't benefit me. Um, it might benefit the people I, I, you know, that I leave my money to, but I don't plan to leave much. Let me, we're let me both- that, Let me change that a bit though, right? Because uh, you know, if, we, if we do growth investing, the market is forward looking. And so it's not that these companies have to be generating trillions of dollars in revenue today. It's just that the market has to believe that they might do that in the future. And then those the, the, the value of those future cash flows gets baked into the valuation today. So you could still yield the benefit, even if the actual real dollars are still many years down the track. Well, if the valuations rise because of that, then fine, then we can benefit from that. Sure. But because of these business because these businesses have so many uh, unknowns that like we don't really know how reusable these rockets are, how how effective, how safe you know, space travel can be. These are not reflected in the share price uh, right now. If the share price goes up and you know and investors are willing to pay for that, then yeah, you're right. We can we can benefit, but I think that's still many years away. This is still many years away before space travel can be seen as a definite yeah. profit maker. Yeah, makes sense. Well, I was going to say that, you know, we're both in our 50s and we're very lucky to be retired. But, you know, it's also painful to realize that we are probably in a back half of our lives. And, you know, our portfolio should reflect that. You know, they shouldn't be these super risky portfolios that we we had during our 20s. You know, in, in my 20s, I probably had like half my portfolio in a, a single stock, which I wouldn't never do now. And so one thing I've done is to gradually transition my portfolio to um, a less risky portfolio. Uh, you could say it's like a transitioning from wealth accumulation to wealth preservation. And so I sold Block, you know, or the company formerly known as Square. And instead, I, and in its place, I bought MasterCard, which I feel is a more stable, uh, safer stock. 
I, I, I think Square is a bit of a junk company. I'm not sure about the product set, and I'm certainly not sure about the leadership. So uh, that seems like a smart play. Yeah, I, 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 I see what you're saying, and uh, I agree with you. And I think I first started having doubts about Block uh, when they bought Tidal, the music streaming service. And that made no sense to me from a business perspective. And I saw it as a vanity acquisition by Jack Dorsey. And I think it was one of your colleagues at Seven Investing, uh, um, Matt Cochran, who you mentioned earlier. And he said one, in one of the videos that you guys produce that he doesn't believe that Jack Dorsey cares about shareholders at all. You know, he doesn't care at all. And I think I'm, incli- I'm inclined to agree. Yep. I don't know if you saw the recent Dorsey news two days ago. Um, like he sold Twitter X to Musk um, and then went on to found Blue Sky, which is supposed to be a competing sort of Twitter-esque platform. Apparently he's just resigned from the Blue Sky board and he's back uh, supporting Twitter as its mission to be one of the central companies in this space. Oh, well, I didn't know that. I'm not really on Twitter anymore, so I don't really yeah. follow what's happening on on that platform. I know that you are, but I'm not. And um, yeah, and as I said, as I said, I uh, I bought Mastercard uh, to, in its place. I actually wanted to invest in Mastercard for several years, and I didn't do that because I thought the stock was too safe and would grow too slowly for my liking. Uh, well, I checked it recently, and it is up eighty percent over the past five years compared to five percent for Square. So you know that tells you how much I know. I also find it a bit. Boring. I know. I know many fintech <laughs> investors like Visa and Mastercard, but um, I prefer something. Well, in my portfolio, uh, that role is taken by Wise, the uh, the UK fintech. I don't know who said it, but um, someone said that investing should be boring. <laughs> yeah. If you're doing it for for entertainment, then you're doing it wrong. Actually, uh, over the last two years, um, yeah, because uh, I've been looking at all the stocks that we bought and then had to kind of clean it up. I've, it really highlighted the importance of position sizing for me. Um, and it, none of the losses that I had were life-threatening for my portfolio. Um, and even now, my largest holding is Mercado Libre. And that's just 8% of my portfolio. Yeah. Um, so even if that went to zero, it would hurt. It would hurt a lot, but I think I'll be okay. And when I see people putting 30 40 even 50% of their portfolio into a single stock. Obviously, it depends on where you are in life, but if you're doing this near retirement, that's crazy. And and uh, I think I saw a story a few weeks ago where this retiree put his life savings into Trump Media, uh, stock symbol DJT, for God's yeah. sake. Uh, and, he, and he lost so much money, they had to go back to work at the age of 70. And that's just really sad to hear. I think something, a conversation you and I had a few weeks ago on WhatsApp and it came up on the Seven Investing Discord. One of our members, who's a little bit older, uh, had said he's he's thinking about structures and approaches to protect himself from deteriorating decision making. Essentially, uh, our friend over at Discord is m- increasingly moving his wealth into um, index trackers and like funds, so it's less discretionary decision making, and he's keeping a smaller portion where it's his individual companies. And, you know, I feel like I've got decades still of actually having my head screwed on and making good decisions, but it is helpful having, like I check pretty much all of my decision-making with you. I generally float it on the WhatsApp a few days at least before I I buy or sell anything and just give you a chance to tell me I'm doing something dumb. And uh, for me, I think that's actually quite an important part of my process because if I do start to and if I say to you, I'm going to YOLO on DJT at some point in the future, like you can say to me, what the hell are you doing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I agree with your friend on Discord. I think, I think over time, I would probably, st- I would probably also move um, most of my holdings into, uh, into funds, index trackers. Because, you know, when I'm 65, 70, I don't, I shouldn't really need the capital accumulation um, from investing in individual stocks and I should be in maintenance mode hopefully yeah like right now I still really enjoy the challenge of managing my own investments and picking my own companies and um, uh, it gives gives me a lot of like reward even beyond the financial benefits 
I enjoy the process of picking what I think are world class companies, and it, it makes me very accountable to have like the majority of my wealth tied up in the stock market. Um, but yeah, you know, maybe that won't always be the case. I might have different priorities when I'm in my sixties, so um, I'm open to that idea. But right now, I've got no plans to switch into uh, passive products. Yeah, me too, Luke. You know, picking stocks and reading about companies is the main reason why I still invest in individual stocks. I enjoy it, you know. And for people who don't enjoy it, just just invest in an index fund. There's no shame in that. You know, you don't have to invest in individual stocks. Actually, when friends ask me about investing, the first thing I'd say is just just invest in an index fund. Start investing in index fund. Start now. Yeah. Start as soon as you can. Just get your money in there and then learn about it slowly. So. That's my advice anyway. Yeah, I've got a bunch of friends who've been tapping me for stock advice, um, in, particularly in the last six months or so, which I I did publicly say on the podcast was a, perhaps a bit of a red flag. <laughs> like do, people do tend to come out of the woodwork when valuations are high. So that's pushed me into having a bigger cash allocation. Um, and it's also a bit thankless. I'm, maybe I'm, I'm sort of ruining the fact that perhaps I've been quite open with my recommendations to friends, always caveating them, like do your own due diligence. But if, I don't know, if Rocket Lab like crashes and burns as a stock, it won't really hurt us. But I'm afraid that maybe some of my friends might have listened to what I'd said, gone a bit YOLO on a company like that, and then suddenly uh, see me as being accountable for like significant losses in their lives. I'm not sure if it was you who said it, but... Uh, if your hairdresser or Uber driver is telling you about stocks, it's time to get out. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, do your own due diligence, whether you're a personal friend or you're listening to the podcast. Um, don't buy a stock because someone told you about it, including us, including Christoph, including me and Albert. Um, and don't over allocate, you know, get your get your wounds in gradually, be diversified. There's a ton of, uh, well, Go check out the 10 Laws of the Jungle download at wallstreetwildlife.com. And Christoph and I have published 10 essential lessons there that will be a foundation of good quality investing for anybody. And in some ways, they're a little bit recycled because Albert and I published um, the telescope investing principles a couple of years ago, and they're not wildly different. And I haven't read Nick Magooley's book, Just Keep Buying, but I'm sure there's some very common threads in there too. Like there are some well understood principles of building long term wealth that don't involve doing crazy things, over allocating, looking for short term gains. This is a long, multi decade endeavor. And if you if you can't get that clear in your head, we probably should steer clear, or at least just passive index invest um, and dollar cost average into the market with. Um, you know, products like VU, the S&P, or um, VWRL, like the FTSE All Share. There's easy ways to get access to the market uh, where you can manage your risk exposure. Funnily enough, uh, Nick Magooley in his book advises against buying individual stocks. Right. Uh, and the main reason he gives, you know, apart from the fact that most people underperform the index, uh, is that it's, it's still almost impossible to tell if you're any good at it. You know, even if you make money over two years, three years, five years, it could be down to luck and you have no idea uh, whether or not you're doing the right thing. Uh, yeah. And my response to that is that does it really matter? You know, if you're, um, if you're playing poker and you're, you're playing, ba- playing badly, but you still win, does it matter? I, 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 I won't turn this into a massive poker analogy. But yes, if you, you can have a couple of winning sessions at the poker table, think you're a genius and then... But if you're making bad decisions and getting lucky, like the luck will run out. If you're making yeah. good decisions and being unlucky, at some point the luck will run out and your good decisions will lead to long-term gains. And it is the same in the stock market. Oh, since you phrased it that way, now I see what Nick is saying. You, know, you might be lucky for the first few years, but if you think you're good, you might take the same risks going forward and then, then lose your shit. Yeah. Like, frankly, I think you and I have enough of a track record that we know confidently we are beating the market and we'll most likely to continue to do that because we've done that for the last 20 years. We've had years where we've underperformed the market, me quite seriously underperformed the market in some years, and I've learned hard lessons from that. So you, know, you do have to treat this as a long-term journey. So you've mentioned quite a few stocks that you've sold, Luke, but uh, are you planning on buying any more? Hmm. 
Yeah, I've got a bunch of things on my investment to-do list I'm thinking about. I'd like to add to Zscaler, uh, but I only bought into that maybe a one quarter ago. So in some ways, I should try and see at least another quarter of accounting. Uh, I'm not sure when they report. It's probably in the next month or so. So I'll probably wait for that. If results look good, I'll probably treat that as a buying opportunity. I think I'm going to add to Rocket Lab. Like maybe that was the... uh, the straw that pushed me across the line, our little chat today. And then one that's been on my watch list for o- over a year now is Palantir. And I haven't read the results, but I gather results were solid. The stock is down. You know, maybe that's an opportunity to stake an initial position. I don't know about that. I need to probably read about that today. Yeah, I don't really know much about Palantir. I own Zscaler and also Rocket Lab. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that you have, have the confidence that they will they will do well going forward. Anything else you're planning to buy? I sold Shockwave Medical recently because it was acquired. It was Johnson & Johnson. They bought it yeah. and yeah. you know they paid the premium for it. And that means the stock price goes up to that premium and more or less stays there until the acquisition date or when the acquisition is completed. So I didn't see any more upside in that. So I sold that. But that does leave me under allocated in the health tech space. And so one company I've been looking at is one called Transmedics, uh, which is in the business of transporting organs for transplantation. And this is a relatively new company, and I don't really know that much about it. So I need to do, I need to do my research first. But yeah, that's one thing I'm considering. Yeah, good shout. Uh, Christoph's a fan of Transmedics. I don't know too much about it beyond the story of what they do in terms of uh, like basically being like FedEx for organs around the world. Um, so in, interesting story. I don't know if the financials add up, but definitely one worth looking at. So Alb, it's been, uh, it's been a couple of years since we had one of these podcast conversations. And um, we always used to get into a bit of pop culture nonsense when we used to chat. So I, I don't know if I've, I should be nervous a lot about asking you this question because you're famous for making terrible movie reviews. And I've definitely wasted far too much of my life with crap like Smallville, the TV show, based on your recommendations. But come on, when you update our listeners, what have you been watching or listening to lately and what do you recommend? Well, after after the introduction like that, what can I say? Um, <laughs> well, I hope my tastes have improved. So one show I can wholeheartedly recommend is one called Shogun that I watched on Disney+. Plus. If you don't know, this is based on a book by an author, James Clavell. Uh, it's a fiction. It's a it's fiction. It's a fictionalized account, of, but based on real life events that happened in Japan uh, a few centuries ago. And I have to say, this is one of the best TV shows I've watched in in many years. Yeah, I've I've, I've also finished Shogun. It was superb. I had a really funny occurrence. I was in Austin visiting Christoph, and he took me to a. A museum on the grounds of University of Texas. And I think we were up to episode seven or eight of Shogun at that point. And as I was literally walking around the museum, I saw a spoiler for the finale <laughs> in the museum because it was a uh, historical account of the battle that Toronaga, who's like the main protagonist in the show, uh, is a historical account of how that battle finished up. Have you spoiled it now for, our, for all your listeners who have not seen this yet? I just said there is a, it's, a, it's about Toronaga. That's all. <laughs> There's no spoilers there. <laughs> So, uh, so what have you been watching, Luke? I'm re-watching Game of Thrones right now. Katrina and I are charging through it for the third time because we want to get, we're trying to get the timing just right to watch all eight seasons of Game of Thrones, then House of the Dragon, ready for House of the Dragon season two, which is in June. But we, we've let the timing get away from us a little bit. And it, it turns out we're watching like a season in two days at the moment. So I think we're going to finish a bit early. We'll probably have to back it off a little bit. Yeah, it's hard watching uh, old TV shows because they used to be so long. I had, I had the idea once of rewatching uh, one of my favorite TV shows, Lost, uh, but then I saw it was six seasons of twenty episodes each, and I and I realized it would take me literally a year to watch this. And I said, "Oh, I can't do it." There's and just you know, the too much of something like Lost. Like it was, it was great at the time, but you know the ending is terrible, right? Do you want to face? I didn't that? think so. I didn't think so. I thought the ending was 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 fine. I don't want to give it away, just in case no one's watched it. But I thought it was fine. You know, it may not be the ending that most people wanted, but it made sense to me. Hey, and I'm watching Game of Thrones, and that didn't finish well either. I guess. 
yeah, that's, that's the main reason why I'm not rewatching it because I know how bad the, uh, the the final season was. Yeah. So go on, give us, give us a more niche recommendation before we wrap up the uh, podcast today. Um, well, apart from the shows like uh, Succession that I'm trying to finish off, I did spend the last three months rewatching uh, Mr. Robot uh, on the, the, the show about the hacker that aired a few years ago. I watched season one and two and then stopped, but then I found out there's a season three and four. So I rewatched the entire thing uh, just to get the whole story again. And I really enjoyed it. Season one is definitely the best. And two and three, yeah, a bit, bit, bit of a slog, uh, but it ended well, I think gets highly rated um i got i got stuck on season two never got past that you, should i go back and give it another go mm, i'm not sure if you thought season two was hard i think season three is even worse it, it really <laughs> really drags uh, okay. but it's only right. four seasons of 10 episodes each so it's right. it's definitely uh, achievable within a within a few months i did go through the uh, imdb top tv shows of all time a little while ago katrina and i watched um the sopranos and the wire both of which were superb and now I am halfway through Band of Brothers, which is like top one or two, depending on which list you look at. It is really good. It's a one season of 10 episodes only. It's pretty epic. So uh, I think that gets a wholehearted thumbs up from me. Um, another thing I watched recently was uh, The Three Body Problem. And this was highly, highly like touted as the, as the show to watch because, because mainly because of the book. The book was so famous. Uh, it was a Chinese author. It was translated to several languages. It just was a massive hit on the sci-fi scene. And I hadn't read the book, so I, I watched, I watched the show, and I have to say, I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. Yeah. I thought so. so actually, I have, uh, I read the. It's a trilogy of books by Sixin Liu, and I read them years ago. Saw the TV show, got excited about it again. I just literally just finished rereading the trilogy a couple of days ago. I think they did a pretty good job of translating the first book to the screen. It's actually the Game of Thrones guys, uh, Benioff oh, and Weiss, the same guys. So but at least they have all the material to work with. So I think they've done a pretty good job of translating a TV show. But I'm kind of worried about where it goes. I don't want to give any spoilers, but having just reread the books, like the story jumps the shark a little bit. Um, oh. They're retconning it a bit in the TV show, I think in a in a smart way, but I don't know how the hell they're going to make this thing. It goes all over the place. Yeah, I don't think I will continue watching this you know, through season two and, and beyond. Right. Well, it hasn't been renewed yet for sure, so we may not get the choice. Well, do you recommend reading the books? Um, if you're into hard sci-fi, but there's better reads out there. Book one and two oh, are good. good. Book three is a bit of a mess, to be honest. Well, I expected the TV show to be hard sci-fi, but I just found it a bit too uh, a bit too daft, a bit right. too many plot holes. Hard sci-fi. Fair enough. Well, it was good. Uh, it was good catching up for an old telescope investing chat. Feels like we uh, never stopped. Maybe I can get you back on the show, even when Christoph is here to join us at some point in the future. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. A few months down the line, Christoph. Well, you know, you and I chat almost every day anyway. But uh, it's good to stick you in front of our audience from time to time and get some of your investing wisdom because you beat me on this investing journey and you and i even though you don't recognize it we're still playing the game at some point my outperformance will drive my right. absolute number of dollars above yours and on that day i shall tell you that you have lost <laughs> but that day looks like it's still a lot many years away i'm pretty sure you'll win though because <laughs> i'm not paying attention anymore so i'm sure you'll win eventually <laughs> don't worry i'll tell you the day you lost well thanks for having me luke and good luck with this podcast and everything else you're doing. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's retrospective chat. It was a bit of a telescope investing throwback, but this is the Wall Street Wildlife Podcast. Christoph and I are your usual hosts. You can find us on all major podcast platforms and at YouTube if you want to see our smiling faces. You can also find all of us at Twitter. I know Albert said he doesn't do a great deal of tweeting, but Albert, what is, what is your Twitter handle? I think it's at Albert Telescope. It is. You don't even know. Yeah, it is at Albert Telescope. I am at 7 Luke Hallard. And you didn't get any Christoph wisdom today, but if you want to check him out, he's at 7 Flying Platypus. Are you going to help me with our uh, standard closing for the show? I'm going to say, are you ready to become a beast of an investor? <laughs> Your journey starts here. <laughs> A 
reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.